Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage and I'm the executive editor with My Security Media. And welcome back. Uh, we have been off for a week or two. And today we're going to be joined by Colonel Neil Greet from the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group. Uh, we're talking MIA, Missing in Action, uh, responding to Australia's climate and security failure. This is the second time we've had the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group on with us. And again, it's one of those uh, ongoing topics of climate change and national security and national resilience. So uh, looking forward to this one and appreciate uh, the uh, Colonel Neil Greet's uh, time. And let me introduce you to Neil Greet, former Australian Army Colonel, or I think you hold your rank anyway, Neil. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Chris. I was, uh, as you did the original introduction, I thought it's important to say we're all uh, retired in the <laughs> yes. Security and Climate Group. We're not part of defence anymore. Uh, yeah, we have experience in it. Therefore, we can say lots of things that others can't say. So, well, uh, yeah. the, the things that you wanted to say when you were in the yes, army, yeah. maybe. Um, and Neil, maybe how, how does the rank uh, hold? You you do retain the rank after you've retired, though, don't you? Yeah, and, and it's you, commission. You do, rank. but um, but a lot of us, and I don't use it. Um, in fact, this is the only circumstance that I've I've probably used it. In, uh, since I since I did retire, um, so yes, um, very good. Well, there you go. I've stuck the retired there uh, correctly yeah, under you. the title. Yeah. Um, now, missing in action, uh, it's a big, big uh, key word. This is a whole of nation climate security risk assessment uh, responding to Australia's climate and security failure. As I mentioned at the introduction, we have had the ASLCG uh, on previously. John Blackburn AO. Uh, joined us when you launched in April, uh, and it was a pleasure to speak to John. Um, maybe talk to this particular report. It's a, it's a, a security risk assessment, and something John and I talked about was national resilience uh, and national security. How does this report fit into uh, the portfolio of reports that the group is forming? And then we'll maybe also how the group is formed itself and, and your role there. But maybe how does this report fit in uh, to the portfolio being built by the group? So, Chris, um, it, it's actually the first report that we've really huh. done as ASLCG. <laughs> so there was the formation, but it was really just a statement that we exist and some short, succinct videos went out, but that was it. Yep. And that was done in the week before um, Biden had his um, Earth uh, Week uh announcement. So it was part of the energy back in then of April and consciously we did it in that week to sort of build off yep. that. So like anything, we had our launch. Well, what next? So we have been talking a lot about what next. And obviously there's a build up to COP26 with all things climate. So uh, we worked to, because a lot of the material there has been in some shape or form in people's minds or part of their work. So it was generally, let's get our first statement of what we think is happening or what hasn't happened, might be more correct, and put that statement out in September uh, so that we're part of the COP conversation before we get swamped by COP, by the way, because uh, as you can imagine, this is going you know, to build you know, a yeah. lot of people talking as we build up to November. So I suppose the, the point is that this is a significant report uh, in terms of the, the group's intent Yes, uh, and you're starting with a, a risk assessment, which is always yes. the right way to go. Um, maybe I think also the weight of these types of reports and the group itself, and hence why our ongoing interest in uh, the leadership or the leaders climate group or the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group. Um, maybe just talk us into the group just to remind the audience if they're not aware, and it is uh, chaired by Admiral Chris Barry, AC, retired, former Chief of the Defence Force. Uh, just how the group sort of works and and has developed this this report so um yeah chris is uh the leader of the group um and he's been long talking about the effects of climate change on national security uh john who you mentioned before a uh, retired air vice marshal i work very closely with john uh, both in this group and the institute of integrated economics research which is the resilience angle that john talks a lot about so yeah. uh, that's there uh cheryl Darren, who's ex department of defense uh uh director on preparedness uh and cheryl's now with the climate council too um michael he's uh 
he's long been involved uh, like a great leader in climate and security, Dr. Michael Thomas. So, um, and um, now who have I left off? And Ian, been, Dun Ian, Ian Dunlop. Dunlop. Yeah. How could I forget Ian? <laughs> Ian, um, as an ex coal executive, as he says, and a man who's just been so strident and so forceful about the security risks that our nation faces uh, if we don't react to climate change. And uh, so we come together um, as a group. Uh, it had been rough, a rough formulation for years, and then it coalesced uh, together to do something this year. Um, and it's uh, the foreword is also by Professor Rear Admiral Neil uh, Morissetti, Morissetti from the, the UK. VRN, retired yeah. as well. Yeah. So again, uh, how how is this report used? Rather, before we do a deep dive into its substance, how how is it used and distributed? Uh, and and delivered to maybe government as well. What, what, how, how... Well, it has been sent to all the ministers uh, right. so that they can see it, uh, and also uh, people across the spectrum of politics. Because, uh, you know, let's cut to the chase. We know that this is such a, a difficult political discussion to have, uh, but we need to have all parts of politics engaged on this. Um, we have also used all our own networks to send it out to different parts of the community that we know. Uh, and uh, so the idea is that uh, we have sent it out, not just to the high level people who make decisions, but also to all people who are interested in national security. Yep. And and that's really important on an issue like this, um, is that people are part of this understanding about how climate change and security and resilience all come together. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So just and on it, the report itself, just, yep. just to emphasise, you said it, it's, it's uh, yourself. We start with a risk assessment. So let's be really pragmatic about what we're trying to achieve here. We want to cut aside some of the uh, vitriol and rhetoric that goes with this and be cold headed about what is the risk and let's let's do it like security professionals do. Right. So that's a nice. conscious thing that we want to practice what we preach. And I think, again, that's why we keep an eye on this, because you are following the, the correct methodology that I would imagine, that objective uh, methodology. Um, but it's not pleasant reading. And again, I mentioned at the start, and most of the audience, my, my sort of tagline is I'm an optimistic pessimist. Uh, and these types of reports kind of underline that thinking, whereas you look at sort of political leadership today and they always go, oh, well, I'm an optimist and we'll be right and, you know, we'll get there. Um, there, there isn't a lot of, um, there's not a lot of answers out of this in terms of that risk assessment. You are just getting, look, we are in a high yeah. risk situation, catastrophic at, at, in areas, extreme in most of it. Uh, and there is a lot to do and a, and a lot to overcome, uh, and somewhat overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. what's your general feel of a report like this and your general optimism looking forward because we are now talking decade by decade now. Uh, you know, there's no point talking to the end of the century. We're talking 1.5 degrees by the end of so 2030, 2050. We're looking at two degrees or more. Uh, and that's still in our lifetimes, uh, I would hope. Um, so, yeah, what's your general take on a report like this and how you felt when you kind of pressed send on it to go, yep, that's ready? Okay, so uh, my frame is it's a serious topic, right? It, it, it is about vulnerability and addressing vulnerability. By nature, it is pessimistic because it is looking at vulnerability. But um, the optimistic frame I would put on it is that people can see what the risk is. They can then think this through. And if the great encouraging thought is, is that young people, are really up to the challenge with this. They understand the risk better than others. And I meet so, in, so many incredibly smart young military and engineering professionals who really can make a change. Um, what I am worried about is complacency. So when you said politicians and optimism, I think political optimism is based in complacency. So they say, don't, and I'm an optimist that all our traditional Traditional systems will work. But what they're really saying is, I don't want to change and I'm complacent. Now, what, what this is all about is actually not being complacent and making change. So, yeah, I'd, 
I'm not sure political optimism is optimism. And this is one of the key things of the report is the absence of leadership, the missing in action. Yeah. And we are, are we talking purely political leadership or is there industry leadership lacking as well? I think it is. It's that high level leadership in the country that's been um, lacking and also confusing to people. I actually think down in communities, um, down in um, a local governments, and even up into our jurisdictions, the state governments, there's real action on climate change within what they can do. And I think you see that in all our states and territories. They have actually made great advancements, perhaps in spite of the federal government. Uh, and there is real leadership down there. And what we don't have is leadership in this security space and this federal space and our outward looking um, international face. So it's that leadership at that level that's lacking. And that's the people we want to touch. We want to touch the people who are in that space, acknowledging there are great leaders in our community who are doing great things on climate change. And, and I'd like to say just this week, so last week we released it. Well, the sports stars came out only three days earlier than us saying they want things done. The farmers have there's farmers for climate change, there's doctors for climate change. There are people lining up in all the professions to say this is important. So there is one part of our leadership that's missing in action. And that would be the federal government aspect of it. Yep. And without sort of going into, we're about to deep dive into sort of the current warming and projections and the dangerous climate change and sea levels. With that leadership, uh, it's things like acknowledgement and uh, sort of coming on to that global uh, sort of exercise where Australia is looking like we aren't doing our, our bit. And then they have the other argument, well, we're only 2% of uh, global climate anyway. And so why bother? What does leadership look like in your mind or from the group's mind? Because again, that's, it really is the title of the, of the report. Yeah, so um, when I joined the army, I always felt that Australia wanted to, you know, it always this rhetoric of a middle power who punched above its weight, you know, and that we strive to, we, we couldn't do all the things that the mighty superpowers could do. But boy, oh boy, we really took the leadership nettle in our grasp and we wanted to make, make a difference, you know, and I, I thought that, I really thought that's what we wanted to do as Australians, right? Yet on this issue, we, we want to do completely the reverse. We use these artificial arguments that, oh, we're just a small island down in the south. Yeah, oh, we do this, but oh, look, it's China, 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 and they're the bad guys. And unless they do something, we don't have to do anything. Well, where's the leadership in that? Where is the leadership? I mean, we're hiding behind this, this skirt of facts and figures and different interpretations so that we don't have to do anything. So I, I I just find that such a disappointing thing because I thought we were better than that as a nation from a leadership perspective. One of the key things I liked in this report, and again, the idea here is also to get people to look at the report. I think you've got yes. to read it. Yeah. Uh, we can't just cover that in, in sort of 10 minutes. We're talking climate change here. Um, but the earth system tipping points, and I think really from that risk assessment viewpoint, that's the one that I think will awaken anybody when you start to see Arctic sea ice, Greenland ice sheet, the boreal forest, Atlantic circulation, Amazon rainforest, West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, the Wilkes Basin, East Antarctica, coral systems and permafrost, the interdependencies of our global climate and how all of these interact in a global ecosystem uh, is really the ones that bring it home of, uh, we're living in a, in a fishbowl really, and if uh, you get an algal bloom somewhere, it's going to impact somewhere else. And so these are the unknowns. We don't know these tipping points and the impact it will have. Uh, and then again, we think, you know, your military, I'm ex-police, we then mm -hmm. think, how's that going to impact society, uh, human security and how humans uh, respond? And I think is that's your thinking as well with this. It's not oh, so much the climate, that's outside, no. we're not climate experts. Yep. But then when these things start to change and we're seeing it things like 
COVID-19 is an excellent sort of precursor uh, of a pandemic and, you know, protests rise, uh, you know, even what's coming out of potentially what we're going to see out of Afghanistan uh, following that, and you served in Iraq. Um, these are the things that we look at and how it's going to impact the Australian way of life. Maybe the implications here at a national security level, what are the types of uh, risks that we will face if these tipping points start to occur, uh, mass movement of populations, uh, loss of some countries and, and uh, parts of cities uh, and the like over decades, periods of time. This isn't going to be like a pandemic where suddenly it's hit us in March 2020 and we're in lockdown and, and we respond like that. This is going to be an ongoing, gradual, seasonal uh, change, like much like we're seeing with our national bushfires. So, Chris, that's, that's it. But yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you, you have this is this is the issue here. Is it's this is a mega trend. This is not a crisis bang, and we can respond to, you know, a terrorist in a street who's done a really bad thing, and we all know he's bad, and bang, we, we can just contain it in this. This is a deep issue that will be. Uh, it'll affect the globe, but it will also affect the globe in different ways. So you went, you rattled off those tipping points, right, around the world. Um, you know, Russia. So Vladimir Putin, when he was last um, president, the first time, about 2007, I think he said, um, he said, oh, well, two degrees won't hurt Russia. With this dream that, you know, the, the Siberia would open up and it'd be sweeping grasslands, you know, and plant lots of wheat. Well, what's happened this year? Fires. Fires have destroyed an enormous amount of Siberia. Uh, and that's what climate change is about. It's not two degrees. Oh, and it's going to be some magic part of the world will do better. Um, now we find it's fire is destroying what they thought that would be great. So that's happening there. So you have those other... So, so different parts of the world are going to suffer different effects. And you mentioned there too, like if we go to South Asia uh, and the link there, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, all the stands to the north, the Himalayas, uh, the third polar cap of the world uh, um, and, and how it will change. The huge populations that live around there rely on the water, right? How is that going to change, right? And you might say to me, well, really does it matter? Because these people have always had disagreements and that it's the historical disagreements that have war. But what effect will heat have on New Delhi and how will people change in response to that when they have no water? What are they going to do? Are they going to migrate? Do they have the capacity to go somewhere? How are we going to look after the humanitarian crisis that would occur? Uh, and the worst thing is, will we actually care? Like, will it become too big a problem that we will just turn a blind eye to it? I mean, these there are an extraordinary amount of ethical questions that come out of this too, because it's not just shooting a, a rifle at someone or firing a tank or firing a missile at a bad person. It's it's a different way of thinking and comprehending what the world would look like. And we've seen it, I think, again, we've spoken uh, to a number of uh, sort of academics as well uh, yeah. from ANU in relation to how the Defence Force is used uh, as well. So we're seeing the Defence Force responding to bushfires uh, and, and other crises as well. They're responding to the pandemic, which is fine from a internal national resilience perspective, but we may also have that external uh, risk and threat as well. Do you think enough has been done in terms of the National Defence Force or do you think we need a national sort of climate sort of resilience force as well or how does that work? That the Defence Force always has that capability beyond uh, whatever civil force has. Uh, yeah. They're always going to be needed, right? And is there enough there to divide, diversify them? Uh, the, as uh, there are greater effects from climate change, the answer is no. So we can't rely on this solution that we have relied on in the past. So just to your point with my personal career, um, one of my last jobs was actually uh, working as a Chief of Defence Force Liaison Officer in response to the Black Saturday fires, right? So I was down there, so I was an intimate part of the, the national and Victorian response. 
Now, the key thing about Black Saturday, the tragedy that it was, and the loss of 173 lives, was that was one day, right? What we saw la uh, the summer before last was different. It lasted for three months. It went down the entire east coast of Australia. And this is the change. So the Defence Force response was not just, in my time, the Reserve Brigade out of uh, 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 Melbourne, supported by some uh, naval and air assets. Last time, it was uh, an enormous amount of the Defence Force had to respond for a long period of time. That is not sustainable. That is not a sustainable solution for the future that we face uh, internally without even addressing the question that you left hanging there. Well, what does that do to our future, our preparedness to be actually able to do other things in a war fighting capacity? So what do we do, Chris? People have said, bring back national service in a form where we put people into a different thing, which is not the defence force. This is John Blacksland has spoken about this. Yes. Um, and we have to do something different. The volunteers, how many volunteers? So the volunteers are the firefighters and the CFA and the New South Wales Fire Service. Uh, where are we going to get those people from? We can't just rely on the goodwill of people. We're going to have to create something new. And it's not that the Defence Force can be a surge capacity. The firefighters can be the firefighters. But for our new challenges, we need something new. And, and it, it's not something that is developed quickly or within a season no. either. This is experience. People will, yep. uh, you can't throw people out to uh, nope. fight a fire if they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and it takes years of experience to do that. Uh, but we're also seeing fire behavior change as well. And hence, yes. uh, there's, there's a lot of interdependencies here. The other thing is, I suppose, I again, come back to things like the geopolitics particularly in our region, uh, the, the fall of Afghanistan, again, back to the Taliban, is a major uh, sort of change in our region again. Uh, and then we've still got uh, the, the China-Taiwan issue uh, and the impacts that these geopolitics have in our region. And then also along with you, then you overlay that or sort of the backdrop is climate change, changing in resources, uh, things like impact on fisheries, uh, you know, food resource, you know, when you look at the India and China uh, divide, you've got almost a third of the, the world's population just right there. Um, and the impacts, say, on, Af on Pakistan in terms of its water resources and the like. So what are your general thoughts and how does climate change impact on our region alongside geopolitics as well? And you mentioned maybe what China's doing in climate change, how serious they might be taking this. So, um this is the relationship with climate change and national security. You can rattle off geopolitics and you can rattle off nations and you can have a, an idea of what a nation may do to protect its national interest. And it will be based on um, behaviours of the past, ideology and all the things that we understand. We understand what combat capabilities they have and what they can, how they can exert force. But what we don't know with climate change is how uh, extreme weather events might change things and how prolonged uh, exposure of people to droughts and significant activities like that and loss of their um, entire um, livelihoods, communities losing, how will they respond? So in Afghanistan, for instance, so we've just gone back to the Taliban, we all understand this war that has gone on in that region for a long time, not just the last 20 years and, and the relationships. So if the Hindu Kush doesn't get as much snow, the rivers don't flow as frequently, what's going to happen there to those people? Uh, will they fight? I, I'd say the country's in for even worse problems. And of course, they'll fight on the ideological grounds that they fought. But what will change is that they're being forced to do something new because of the climate changes and where they live. They can't live where they used to. They'll move to other places. And, and these are the unknowns that we don't know. How, how is that going to cause pressure on India? So what will India do in response with China? And, you know, so we've got to think about climate change as an effect that it has on the geopolitics. 
Well, that brings me to Syria because I think those types of changes will happen and yep. the people on the ground, those being forced to move, change their behaviour or their behaviours change, yeah. they won't even realise it at the time. Like you're just reacting right. to a set of circumstances yeah. and you don't know. It's not until afterwards in hindsight that yes. you go, ah, that's why that was happening. And that takes us back to, to Syria and as yeah. climate change was a driver. And we talked pre-interview about the language around there's been there's been no direct connection, yep. as I understand, between climate change and the Syrian conflict, but the impact on farmers moved, forced some to move. Maybe just talk us through. Yeah, so the report raises that here in some detail, and it does. And uh, the thing was, you know, back in those two, early 2010, you know, the Arab Spring and democracy launching itself across uh, across the Arab world, and how great that was. And we only thought in that one we that's with the Western world, saw this as a great thing, liberal democracy coming to that part of the world and and the governments would then all do the right thing and everything. So what we didn't know what was playing out was there was this prolonged drought in Syria that was taking place. And uh, Assad was actually putting his thugs out there and they were poisoning oil wells to sort to move. And what they sought, and it wouldn't have mattered, you know, perhaps if, everything else hadn't coincided, but they were trying to move the relationship of some of the uh, communities, so, you know, townships and villages to be, um, you know, those that he liked and those that he didn't like. Um, but what happened was it coalesced with this Arab Spring, a drought and availability of, you know, weapons and ammunition coming out of the Middle East. All of those come together to form a, an event which has seen the Syrian civil war start and just continue and of course lack of natural resources and the ability of people to survive in Syria has been harmed by um, the whole climate change in the region so it has an ongoing effect in the war too and so is it the driver Chris see this is the point um, people want me to say oh you know it caused the war well it didn't cause the war by itself it's how these things come together in a systems, in an ecosystem, and that's the difficulty. We can't, in the future, we won't be able to say, oh, it's one bad thing here. We're going to have to think multidimensionally about the challenge of climate It's going change. to change what we knew to be somewhat predictable. Yes. Uh, the environment that, that the theatre of yeah. whatever conflict or, or activity will be, will be different. Uh, and again, it might even have to change the way defence forces uh, are structured as well, because obviously it's going to impact the way potential conflict, military conflict is is fought as well, both yeah. seasonally, uh, you know, in terms of how you keep the troops watered and fed. Uh, all of that will also change, I imagine, as well. We are talking two to three de degrees warmer uh, in the next 20 years. Uh, and we've yeah. seen with Afghanistan how quickly 20 years goes. Uh, and I think that's the biggest thing for me now that I'm getting a bit older and you look back and 20 years is a blink of an eye uh, and we are literally talking uh, the three to four degrees warming uh, as an existential threat. And uh, that's going to start to hit us in within that uh, 10 to 15 year period. Um, so I think one of the main things I can only encourage people to do is pick up the report, have a look. Uh, the last one was the, uh, the risk conclusions as well. Um, one thing you didn't touch on there before I close off, uh, Neil, was China and uh, how China, how this might change the China and US relations, uh, how this might impact on, say, the Australian and China relations. Not that it's not in very good stead, but if China's doing more in climate change than Australia, that's uh, not a good look for us either. So how, what's the position of China in your opinion? So there's two things I want to answer or say about China in this respect. First thing is there is a, a school of thought is that climate change is secondary to the threat that uh, China has in a geopolitical context, right? And that what we need to do is address the big geopolitical problems first, and then after we've solved that, then we'll go come on to these smaller issues like climate change. The problem with that is this is not sequential, right? These are things that are happening at the same time and concurrently. So directly, so 
you've got to understand that. So the relationship now is how does China uh, move in this climate space? I remember to 10 years ago being told about how many solar panels China was producing. And if you said a gazillion bazillion like Austin Powers, right, it was just a mind blowing figure. China is moving rapidly into renewable energy. And yes, it still has a lot of coal fire power stations, but it is moving rapidly in that space, right? It is not, it has a lot to change, but it is certainly trying to promote itself uh, around the world as a leader in climate change. And unfortunately, the US lost that position during the Trump era. Um, and so it is a very much a diplomatic issue that affects climate change, energy and water security and all of those things. So um, it's not simple, right? I suppose and it's another it's another element there in terms of the diplomacy yeah. and how climate change diplomacy takes place as well, yeah. uh, where particularly our Pacific Island nations, our Southeast Asian uh, nations as well, who they turn to for say, let's say for leadership for a start, but also for assistance. Yeah. Uh, and again, that is so, something that we haven't considered. Yeah, so I feel really sad about the Southwest Pacific, right? Because as an army engineer um, in my early career, we used to do a lot of work through the Southwest Pacific. Uh, and then we got too smart. We withdrew out of that because, you know, they were big enough and ugly enough to look after themselves. And besides, New Zealand can look after that part of the world while we go off to the real issues with the big players, right? And we literally abandoned, well, we abandoned the Southwest Pacific. And then shock horror, we were surprised that China came in and, you know, exerted its influence. I'm not saying China's done it for nice reasons, but we vacated that space. Uh, and now we have to rebuild a relationship and we have to do things to allow, you know, to help Southwest Pacific re respond to climate change. We need to be there at the forefront, helping them mitigate the effects. And they want us there. So we've got to get back in there and do something. But that team, that means money. That that does mean thinking about this in a different way. And you do say there about force structure and options and the different way we do it. Um, how we do that, I think we really have to lift our game there. Well, one of the outcomes was ill-prepared. Our assessment is that Australia is ill-prepared to deal with the consequences of global warming which requires decisive policy action, both in terms of mitigating the threat and an understanding of and preparedness to respond to climate security risks. I think that's another key one. This isn't talking about climate change, climate warming, it's climate security risks. Yep, and it's pretty much what we've discussed here uh, in a uh, solid 30 minutes. Uh, and we've only just touched a very much yep. surface uh, yep. and hence why uh, pull out that report have a look, it's uh, it's well written, it's well structured and uh, well referenced as well. Uh, and I think uh, the accolades from the, uh, from the authors also gives it some punch. So it's good to know that our leaders have been given a copy. Uh, like I said, we do have it available. It was in our newsletter this morning and uh, it's available on the marketplace as a resource. Uh, and on that note, Neil, I think uh, we could literally talk all day and not even get into uh, things like, uh, you know, your opinion on things on Afghanistan and uh, yep. and what's happening in the Middle East as well. Uh, but hopefully we'll stay in touch with the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group. Uh, and I appreciate we've had uh, John and now yourself, Neil, on to join us. So thank you very much for your time. No, thanks for the invitation, Chris. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. And any any closing uh, call to action, uh, Neil? What's what's the group got coming up or planned? You mentioned the COP. Oh well, we're not directly involved, so we'll yep. follow up now on uh, discrete parts of what the vulnerabilities are and what we face. So yes, so yep. um, yeah, you'll you'll continue with more reports. What's following a security risk assessment? Then uh, you end up with a uh, security management plan after that, I imagine. Well, let's let's get. <laughs> Let's get people on side so that we can actually yep. have some agreement. It is meant to prompt people to think, right? Uh, yep. And so if it gets that happening, that's a good thing. Get well, us out of our complacency. Absolutely. And I don't think it's even your responsibility to come up with a security management plan. I think that is the government's responsibility. Oh, yeah, that's and right. that's where uh, you mentioned John Blackburn and, um, yep. and the like. 
we do need a national resilience plan, which would be a security management plan uh, moving forward. And I, you know, I, I back that call as yeah. well. So look, thank you so much, uh, Neil. I'll put you backstage and uh, yeah, look forward to having you on again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Cheers, mate.